Good morning, members. We'll call this meeting to order. We have an intense uh, meeting before us, so we'll get right started right away. Uh, I just want to start uh, by thanking uh, folks in the uh, different agencies uh, for uh, working so hard to uh, give us a uh, what I think is going to be an graduate level uh, college course on what's going on in Minnesota's groundwaters today. And I think it's a particularly appropriate, uh, I had, as I listened to uh, Dr. Mark Seeley, uh, when we had him before, I took home one phrase that he said, and I can't get it out of my head. And he said, unfortunately, our soil moisture measurements are at the lowest levels we have ever measured. With that in mind, um, groundwater becomes even more important. Uh, so let's start. And I wait, uh, let's welcome uh, Jason Meckel, uh, who has taken the lead to organize this presentation. Uh, welcome to the committee. And would you put your name in for the record? Thank you and good morning, Madam Chair and members. We really appreciate the opportunity to testify here this morning. My name is Jason Meckel. I work for the Department of Natural Resources in the Division of Ecological and Water Resources. As has been alluded to, the importance of groundwater and managing it sustainably cannot be overstated. Uh, Representative Wagenius and Hansen have asked us to provide you all with the status report on Minnesota's groundwater resources. And specifically, they have asked us to give you very technical information and use some case studies to try to illustrate what it is that we know about our groundwater and the challenges we face and some of what we don't know. Um, Representative Wagini has talked about graduate level. And um, we've organized a number of speakers here. We're going to be moving fairly quickly through a number of very technical topics. One might uh, think of that as trying to drink from a fire hose. Um, so we hope that we don't frustrate you. The visuals of this room aren't the best, but I understand you're all getting used to that. Uh, we've got a lot of charts, a lot of graphs, a lot of maps. Um, many of those rely on color. These folks are going to do their best to try to describe those images so that folks in the audience as well can, can understand what it is that we're trying to present. The summary sheets that were handed out here hopefully will serve as sort of key point uh, and key messages, reminders, places for you all to maybe take some notes. And as I understand it, we're going to just go through the series of presentation and then uh, save some questions for the very end, and we'll try to keep some time for that. What we hope to leave you with is a much better understanding of our state's groundwater resources and appreciation for the challenges we face. Simply stated, the problem is that we are increasingly recognizing that there are places in Minnesota where we are not achieving sustainability of our groundwater resources. And we are currently making decisions with a lack of information. I've put the we in quotes here because the we is all of us. It's individuals, it's municipalities, it's business, it's state government. And then we can simply think about this in terms of two key risks. One is the overuse of our groundwater, and the second is the contamination of our groundwater. Today's presentations are going to be focused on the overuse. Next Tuesday, we've organized a series of speakers to talk about what do we know about the contamination side of our groundwater. Representative Wagini has talked about um, Mark Seeley's comments about soil moisture. And I thought that um, given the discussion on Tuesday, this would be an appropriate place to start. This is a map that depicts the current status of drought in Minnesota. You'll note here that the darker colors uh, represent extreme drought. Over 25% of the state now is considered to be an extreme drought. All of the state is in some sort of uh, abnormally dry to moderate or severe drought. And we don't expect that to change very much. I think somebody had said uh, recently that unless we get 12 feet of snow in the next couple of months, th this will not change uh, until we get into spring. 
But this has significant consequence to small business, to municipalities, to water suppliers, and to individuals. Some communities, the city of Fairmont, for example, that relies on a lake for their, surface, for their water supply are in a very precarious situation as the lake levels have declined through the drought and wondering what might they do if the moisture does not return. On Tuesday, many of you heard about the challenges that climate change brings. And many of you had asked questions about what does that mean for our groundwater. And we hope that the presentations this morning will help you understand that. Dr. Seeley did speak about the fact that with a climate that we're experiencing now, we are now seeing floods and droughts in the same year and even in the same location. Duluth, Minnesota is an unfortunate example of that. This is a headline from an article recently in the Duluth News Tribune on December 31st. Some Northland wells running dry in drought. This area received nearly 10 inches of rain this summer and the floods. But by October, homeowners were experiencing wells that did no longer produce water. The quote here, I think, speaks loudly from Mrs. McKay, whose well had gone dry. I didn't think it was possible to run out of water in a land of 10,000 lakes. We've never had any problem before in the 14 years that she's lived there, and other neighbors are going, wells are going dry. Our sense is that the land that Minnesotans generally think of Minnesota as the land of plenty when it comes to water. And so this notion of having scarcity is becoming sort of a startling awakening for many folks. I want to just illustrate here this map. In the center of that map is Mrs. McKay's house where her well went dry. Inside that red circle, which is a one and a half mile radius, there are 161 individual homeowners who have wells. That's what they rely on for their water. Now, this just illustrates a bit of the trend that we see in Minnesota. This is that same one and a half mile radius. This is from 1970 till now. How many wells were installed in that area? And this is a cumulative number. If you look at where that arrow points, that was 1988, the last major big drought that we had. Since that time, we've gone from a little over 30 wells in that area to the 161 that I'm describing. And if you look at the cumulative amount of estimated use of water, and I say estimated because there is no data available here. Individual wells are not required to report the information uh, unless they're using over a million gallons a year. Uh, so the estimate is that uh, each of these households would use 400 gallons a day, 146,000 or so gallons per year. Uh, adding up to 23.5 million gallons in that vicinity. <laughs> Quite a change over time. The other headline, and we won't speak to this today, but it sets up for Tuesday, is Minnesotans paying the price for crop fertilizers at the faucet. Our colleagues from the Department of Health, Agriculture, and Pollution Control will provide you with the most up-to-date information they can about groundwater contamination, and that's next Tuesday. Last, before I turn this over to my colleagues, oops, I want to say just a word about monitoring. You're going to hear this word quite a bit from us. The idea here is that monitoring is a term that gets thrown around. But what we use the term monitoring, what we're meaning is the collection of information to answer specific questions through time. And a simple way you can think about this is water level and wells. Are the water levels changing over a period of years and decades? Do they change as a result of pumps going on? How might that affect water levels in streams, lakes, wetlands nearby, or in neighboring wells? These are the kinds of things that you're going to be hearing about. But we wanted to make sure, because we will say monitoring, but it means it has some meaning. And the same thing would be true of chemistry. And folks on Tuesday will talk some more about that. So with that, I am going to turn the microphone over to Jim Stark from the U.S. Geological Survey, and he's going to talk to you about sustainability of groundwater resources and what that means. Welcome to the committee. Good morning. Representative Wienius, members of the committee, it's a pleasure to be here today. 
Would you it's just an honor to talk to you about uh, name on the what? record, please. Just my, say your name. My name is Jim Stark. I'm the director of the Science Center for the U.S. Geological Survey here in Minnesota. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about water sustainability, about our progress and plans. And uh, this is a meeting about groundwater, but intentionally, my first slide here focuses on water and not on groundwater. And that's intentional because one of the messages I want to leave with you today that. Uh, our groundwaters, our streams, and our lakes all, are all related, and we can't think about one without thinking about the other. Uh, the uh, uh, the slides on the the pictures on this slide are pictures of White Bear Lake, and uh, White Bear Lake has been much in the news recently. Uh, some of uh, these pictures show some of the extensions that have been made to docks, and uh, just represents some of the effects that. Uh, sustainability might have on our lakes and streams, on those who uh, use those, live on those lakes and use those resources, and why uh, White Bear Lake has become a poster child for sustainability. So I want to talk about the sustainability effort that's been underway for about five years within the state of Minnesota. Uh, this is a work in progress and a collaborative effort, and I've just listed on the slide some of the individuals and organizations of the state agencies that have been involved in this effort for a number of years. So we're not starting at this point. We're really continuing on uh, on a focus that has been underway for some time. My summary points. Uh, Minnesota really, and this is what I'm going to leave you with, I hope, today. Minnesota really has a unique opportunity to ensure sustainable waters for future generations. Uh, a fundamental part of that is the Clean Water Land and Legacy Act. There's been a lot done. Uh, the foundation for this work is in place. There are some missing pieces that we need to focus on and continue to work on, but a great deal of the work has been done. Uh, the targets for ensuring sustainability uh, are moving targets, and they relate to things like global change. And we really should not wait for uh, <clears throat> all the data that we need to be collected or all the analysis of that data to be complete. We really need to move forward. Uh, we really need to look at adaptive management of our water resources. And a part of that is really an automated water appropriations permitting process that accounts for water, the water we use, and the amount that's available to us on a sustainable basis. That's really a critical part of this process. So what do we mean by water sustainability? Well, of course, it's defined for us in statute. A couple of the key points in that definition, I think, are protecting ecosystems, preserving water quality for the future, and ensuring clean water for future generations of Minnesota. It's really using water uh, without causing problems in the future. Uh, sustainable water planning really <coughs> requires accounting for the water that flows through our aquifers from areas where it's recharged to the land surface to our lakes and streams. So it's really a system that we have to think about. And on this slide, if you'd maybe focus on the light blue, uh, this is one of the simplest examples I can provide for you, which kind of demonstrates the difference between available water that we have and sustainable water. And if you consider that aquifer and that water moving from the land surface to the stream, all of that light blue water is in storage. In some ways, it's really all available for us. But it's not available on a sustainable basis. It's really just a very small part of that water in storage, which we can use uh, now to ensure that we will have water resources for our lake streams and aquifers in the future. So, so part of that accounting really means that we understand groundwater recharge. Recharge is the water that uh, is the source of water for our aquifers and the source of water to our lakes and streams. So this is a very <clears throat> approximated map of the variability in groundwater recharge to our aquifers across the state. And you can see it varies from the brown color in the west, where it's about an inch or two a year, <clears throat> to uh, far northeast of Minnesota, where it's about a foot a year. So there's a lot of variability in the amount that we use to recharge our accounts, our water accounts each year. <clears throat> we know something about this. Uh, we need to refine those estimates, and that work is really being done and is underway um, through a collaborative effort by state agencies and by the U.S. Geological Service. So we're refining those estimates and providing better estimates of that part of the accounting balance. 
we also need to really understand surface water flow and how groundwater flow supports our streams and lakes. And we do that through measuring stream flow and by a, uh, a system of stream gauges which exists throughout the state of Minnesota. Those gauges are uh, operated by uh, several different partners, the USGF, the Army Corps, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, Met Council, in cooperation with the PCA and the DNR, and also local uh, agencies like Watershed District. So those systems are being integrated, and we really need to continue that process and expand though that system, which is being done, uh, to account for the flow in our streams that comes primarily from groundwater. We also need to estimate flow in places where we don't have gauges. <clears throat> that work is also underway. Um, <clears throat> work by the, by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the DNR, and the USGS is focusing on a process where we can estimate groundwater flow in streams throughout the state in areas where there are, are not gauges. <clears throat> so what is water sustainability? and should we worry about it? I think the answer to that is that we should. We face growing demands and competition for water. And sustainability, sustainable water resources for the future really means more than providing adequate supplies for our human needs. And I'll describe that as availability. So sustainability is different and more, more important than availability. We all know water is important in Minnesota. Groundwater and surface water really are one resource. Groundwater supports our streams and lakes. It's important for human needs, but it's also important for aquatic biology, for our fish and invertebrates in our streams, for recreation, and for downstream waste assimilation. Our actions today really affect future ecosystems and humans. But we have to keep the focus on sustainability, not just on the amount of water we have available in the state, you all know we have a lot of water available. It's a water-rich state. White Bear Lake declines in some of our deep aquifers. And the drying up of some of our urban wetlands are some examples of why we need to focus on this problem now. Our ecosystems need to be a major consideration in the sustainability discussion. And our biota in our streams, our fish, invertebrates, our mussels, really all have need to have a place at that negotiating table. So what is water sustainability? Uh, again, it's more than what we need for our human needs. Um, some, con some fundamental concepts regarding sustainability and water availability. Um, there's a great deal of water available to us in Minnesota, but only a small part of that is available to us on a sustainable basis. Groundwater overuse really becomes apparent to us and newsworthy when it affects our lakes and streams. We need to preserve clean water for streams and lakes, for our biology, for our water supply, and for downstream waste assimilation. But flow variability, the highs and lows in our streams as it relates to groundwater and runoff are both important. And we need to determine sustainability targets. <clears throat> this graph is uh, the simplest example I can give to you to describe the difference between available water and sustainable water. And think of this graph as a graph of flow in streams over time, like over a year. Uh, we, have, uh, we have periods of low flow represented by the, uh, the lower parts of this graph, which are times when streams are supported primarily by groundwater, it's called base flow. And we have periods of peaks generally in the spring and early summer, where most of the stream flow is supplied by runoff. That variability between the highs and lows are really important for the biology in our streams. So if you think of the solid line, the upper line, as the amount of stream flow at a point in the stream over a year, um, that represents the total volume at any given time, and the area under that curve is the total volume of water passing that point. The dotted line then represents the amount that we have to preserve in our streams uh, to ensure that our streams are healthy. So the difference between those, the area shown in blue, uh, is really the amount that we have available to us on a sustainable basis. And as you can see, that's generally a pretty small part of the total amount of water that's available to us. 
from a screen, which is that type of ground board. So, sustainability, it's, co it's a complicated topic, and it involves, in addition to hydrology, a lot of non-hydrologic issues. Technical information and analysis are really important. However, we also have to consider socioeconomic constraints, ecological complications, and legal and regulatory and political considerations as we think about sustainability. So it's important, it's complicated. How will we know and will we know if we get there in, in that process of ensuring sustainable water? Well, we should. Um, there are many efforts that have taken place, interagency efforts, collaborative efforts, over about the past five years, which have looked at this topic, have outlined the important constraints, and have, have developed a rough plan for moving forward. Uh, I've listed these, uh, these efforts. Many of those have resulted in reports uh, which are available to all of us. Um, but a lot of good work has been done by a lot of important people. However, I think the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Act really gives uh, the residents of this state a charge to move forward. This is really this really is a unique opportunity. And as I talk to my colleagues from other states, they're really amazed by the uh, the charge that has been given to us by the citizens of the state and the opportunity that this represents uh, for us as a state. But with that come high expectations. Um, Coming out of the, that act was a charge to the university to develop a framework to provide the details for moving forward. The university directed the, or the legislature directed the university to determine needs to preserve clean water for the future. That effort involved many experts, citizens, and interest groups who put together collective information and develop recommendation, and it provides the roadmap. And if you're not familiar with this document, this is the document that came out of that framework study. It's really an informative and good piece of work. It sets the stage for us. What does it suggest? It calls for preserving clean water, understanding water budgets. Like our finances, we really have to understand the amount that flows in from our paychecks and the amount that we uh, use to pay for what we want to have, and we have to keep that in balance. Or, or our waters will have, have considerable issues. Um, it calls for water budgets to improve the appropriations process, for integrating policy and management, for recognizing the interconnections, the interconnected nature of groundwater and surface water as it relates to ecology, drinking water, downstream needs, water quality, and recreational needs. A lot of the tools that we need to put this management package together exist. I've listed some of them for you on, on this graph graphic. Uh, I won't talk about these. I'll highlight a couple. The County Geologic Atlas Program is fundamental. Uh, the water use, uh, water appropriation process at the DNR is, is a critical part of that. The stream flow network is, is critically important. And ecological flow programs by the DNR, the Nature Conservancy, the PCA, and others also are fundamental blocks in this process. We need some other things. We need to do some other things. We need to better understand groundwater recharge. We need to enhance and and, and the stream flow network system and provide stream flow estimates in areas where there aren't gauges. We need to automate the water appropriations permit and build into that an accounting process so we understand the amount we use with respect to the amount that we have available on a sustainable basis. Together, these steps will allow us to quantify our water budgets, to define available water, and to determine the sustainable amount of that water uh, that we can use on into the future. What needs to be done? Ecologists and hydrologists really need to agree to preserve stream flow variability, to preserve base flow in our streams, to determine the ratios between available water and sustainable water, to define that blue area on this graph, as the sustainable amount that we have available. <clears throat> Some of these will be somewhat subjective decisions, and we can't really wait for more precise numbers because things are changing. Um, our climate and our hydrology is changing over time, and we really have to, have to keep, move into a process of adaptive management. The vision for moving forward, 
merge and synthesize our groundwater, surface water, and mycological information, refine water budgets by watershed and by aquifer. That defines for us the total amount of water we have available. From that, we really need to consider biological needs, water quality, and downstream needs to define the amount we have available on a sustainable basis. We need to refine and automate the appropriations permit to account for water in the system and the amount being used to preserve those sustainable targets, that blue area in the graph, and provide oversight for an interagency effort by a group like the Clean Water Council. My summary points, Minnesota really has a unique opportunity to ensure sustainable water for our future. In this land of 10,000 lakes, we still really need to focus on this. The foundation for that work is in place. The missing pieces are being put together, and we really should not wait for uh, for all of the data we might want or all the analyses of data um, before we move forward. And automated um, automating the appropriations process with water accounting is really a critical step in that process. And I think we're really at a point um, within the work of the state agencies here where. We're at a point where we can do more than putting out fires in terms of managing our water. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Jim. With that, I'd like to um, have Dr. Jeanette Leet come up and talk to us. Representative Morginius, <coughs> committee members, my name is Dr. Jeanette Leet. I work at DNR in the Ecological and Water Resources Division. <coughs> I'm here to talk to you about the metro and southeast parts of the state, parts of the state you would normally consider water rich because of the deep productive aquifers that underlie them. But even so, there are management issues to consider here. I'm going to use the word we the same way Jason did. DNR brings its particular skills to a given task and we draw upon the areas of expertise of our partners when we are dealing with specific problems. My presentation borrows liberally from the work of others. Groundwater is the hidden resource beneath that your standard of living depends on. It is in the materials beneath your feet. It's in cracks in the rock. It's between sand grains. It's in layers that let water move easily, and it tries to move through layers that won't let water move so easily. It's moving in response to natural events, and it's moving in response to human activity. The vitality of our future communities is closely tied with successful management of this resource. Minnesota deserves the best management we can all provide. In aggregate, about 75% of drinking water comes from groundwater. But that sort of understates the importance of groundwater because groundwater is the only backup we have when surface water has dried up. I'm going to show you where these particular um, water sources are located. Surface water is used in the communities that have the red dots. Large communities typically on major rivers. Communities lucky enough to be on Lake Superior. And there are communities that take water from mine pits. This pattern of dots along our major railways and highways is the pattern of community wells. And then this black fog is created from dots. Every single private well that we have a record of plotted on the state sure turns it pretty dark. If we count up the water used by permitted wells, and as Jason had mentioned, private wells don't have permits, so we have no record of their water use, we see this pattern. 
Our records in this um, detailed format start in about um, 1988, and you see a rising trend on public supply. Well, what do we know about Minnesota since that um, point in time? We probably had 4.3 million um, residents in the beginning, and we maybe have 5.3 now. We can see on this graph the impacts of climate, particularly if you look at the green that's supposed to show you irrigation water use. Pick a wet year, flooding in Iowa, 1993, practically no irrigation use. You don't water when you don't need to. And then there's a rising trend. <clears throat> but if you look back at 1988 where it started, and we know that was a drought year, the peak that we have is not that much higher than the 1988 water use. But I will bet you, when we have 2012 to plot, we will see possibly the state's highest water use ever. So what will happen if we stay on this trend? There are some indications. We don't have the right presentation. <laughs> looks like a different PowerPoint has been loaded. So I wasn't going to talk about any fiscal cliffs. I mean water use cliffs, but I guess I am. <laughs> there are signs that water use in some places and um, from some sources is not sustainable. And if we don't change the way we're acting, we have no reason to suspect that we will have a good result. Let's look at the metro. Some of you may live in the metro area. If you have your own well, it's one of those pink dots. If I had to use black, you wouldn't have seen a thing on this map. Red again are the surface water intakes. Green are groundwater wells. And we are really lucky. We live at the confluence of major rivers. This means that we have the opportunity to use super surface water when it's abundant and groundwater when it's not. That concept is called conjunctive use, and it's a concept I hope to hear more about as we work with the Metropolitan Council and others <coughs> on metro water supply. <coughs> we can't see groundwater except at springs and at seepage faces. We have to rely on measuring water levels in wells and in different aquifers at a given location. So you may need more than one well at the same place to tell what's going on. Can, can I ask, well excuse me for just a minute, can you move the microphone just a little closer to you? Uh, folks in the audience are having trouble hearing. Thanks. Frequent well measurements can reveal patterns. Here we see summer pumping drawdowns in the Twin Cities major aquifer, the Prairie de Chien Jordan. We can identify the 1988 drought and recovery. That's the first major dip. And we did measure a record low in 2009. And right now, water levels are similarly low. If we don't get good soaking rains, we will go way below what we had in 1988. One thing I'd like you to notice is how the summer pumping impacts are expressed. If you're looking at that rising trend before we start down to 1988, those zigzags in, in the curve are summer drawdowns. So during the summer, we're using more groundwater, and you'll see the water level decline. In the fall, water use declines water levels typically rebound. So the pattern is rather muted in that first period of time. But look at the major swings that we're getting as we go into the 2000s. Um, summer, the difference in the fall water level and a summer water level is quite great. So we see both the impacts of climate and of human water use revealed in these charts. Now I want to show you the value of having a really, really long record to look at. This well is at Minnetonka Boat Works. It's been in place since 45. Again, we see the impacts of climate. When we have um, very, a, a large number of seasonal drawdown 
signatures, it's easy to look easier to look at either the top tops of all of those or the bottoms of all of those. I like looking at the tops, and I can find 1988 dry spell, and I can see that we're currently, right now, at a very low water level. The record drawdown ever measured in this well occurred this past September. We can take measurements from a set of wells at about one time. We call that a synoptic water level measurement, and it gives us a snapshot of water levels. We could contour those and we would have this surface of what the water levels looked like at that snapshot. Then if we went out again, say in the fall, and got another snapshot, we could subtract the two and figure out what the seasonal impact of pumping is. This graphic is from our last metro-wide synoptic where we took March 2008 readings and we took August 2008 readings. Subtract the difference and there you have your seasonal drawdown. This graphic is not meant to scare anybody. It does look pretty bad, but I would like to point out that there's only one black dot in the middle of all of that drawdown. If you don't have a good groundwater, monitor, groundwater level monitoring network, you can't pick up all the little dimples that this surface might be made up of. So one well in the center of this drawdown biases the whole graphic. We are working on improving our groundwater level monitoring network though. Over the um, past, from 2003 to uh, 2012, we have been brought our groundwater level monitoring network up to about 851 wells. And of those wells, 329 are instrumented so that they can record measurements much more frequently than people could measure wells by going there in person. I was just showing you a, draw, a summer drawdown in the Mount Simon Hinckley Aquifer. It is our deepest aquifer in the Twin Cities, one that we, the big we, feel is reserved for future drinking water. This is its hydrograph, a well near Savage, from, 19, from the late 60s through now. There is a time where the downward trend on this looked pretty bad. I was asked, um, well, Jenny, why don't you figure out how long that's going to last? And of course I took the mathematical approach, figured out how fast it was going down, and you know, when would it hit the top of the aquifer, which would mean there's no water above the aquifer to draw from. And I came up with 141 years. Well, that was during the red part of the graph. At the time, the city of Savage and communities around it <coughs> were working with us and the Met Council to try to figure out what you could do to keep water use from impacting Eagle Creek Boiling Springs and Savage Fen. The communities worked together and came up with an innovative solution to use water from the Kramer Quarry. It's groundwater, has been recently groundwater, but needs special treatment. And the water was going to use up in the, end up in the river. They were going to dewater the quarry, put the water in the river. Why not use that water? It's pretty much done the work it had to do. Its next stop was the river. Well, that plan was put into place, and one would hope that part of the recovery here, this is that same well, magnified that last bit of the hydrograph. Part of our recovery is that we've made a change, and we see a positive impact of that change. If we have a good monitoring network, we will be able to make management decisions, apply them, and see if they work. Groundwater supports other things. Groundwater supports rare resources at the surface. And the ones that come most frequently and easily to mind are cal mine, are calcareous fens, these purple dots, trout streams, the blue lines that um, head toward the Lake Superior on the North Shore and toward the Mississippi in the southeast. And notice that the major rivers also get blue lines on this chart. Well, not that they're rare, but they do get their base flow from groundwater. So they are 
supported by groundwater. Our quality of life depends on groundwater in a, in a most basic way. Trout streams are fed by groundwater. Oh, I did say before, didn't I, that groundwater is hidden? Um, I lied. That's me looking at groundwater. I'm standing on top of a calcareous fen in winter. In the winter, the plants aren't growing. Normally, at a calcareous fen, the amount of water the plants use up balances the amount of groundwater that comes out. In the winter, that's not working, and you get these magnificent fields. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Don't work. Um, there's not that many more slides. So I want to tell you a story about a particular trout stream, Campbell Valley Creek in the southeast. I just told you that um, these streams are supported by groundwater. That's why they're cold. That's why trout can live in them. The landscape where the tr these trout streams are is a karst landscape. Karst is a landscape that consists of sinkholes, conduit flow, springs, and you wonder, well, why does that happen? When there's limestone or other easily dissolvable material near the surface, water moving through cracks and joints can widen those cracks and joints. And at some point, maybe those cracks and joints get so big you call them conduits. And conduits flow can end up discharging at a lower elevation to a, to a spring, sometimes through something that actually looks like a hole, sometimes along just a wet area of sand or soil. <clears throat> when enough of this has happened, Oh, the limestone at the surface can collapse, leaving a, a divot. Well, that's a sinkhole. From then on, uh, water flowing at the surface will tend to end up in that hole and then practically instantly in groundwater. We have a karst expert who works with the University of Minnesota trying to figure out how water moves in these systems. This area has at the surface prairie de Chaine and there are no springs coming out of this Prairie du Chien. So water does go in to sinkholes in the Prairie du Chien, and it must be traveling another aquifer down. So that was the presumption, so they put dye in. The dye was found less than a month later in two aquifers down, which is called, uh, in an aquifer called the Tunnel City Formation. <clears throat> this result, is very new, and it does prove that in places, some of the aquifers we had previously considered well protected from impact from activities on the land surface are indeed still vulnerable. <coughs> Just as a parting thought, I wanted to show you how well LIDAR works for picking up features on the landscape. Sinkholes can be seen like perfect little divots. It's wonderful, and we're just starting our improving our inventory of sinkholes and other features. <coughs> In closing, groundwater matters. Thanks, Jeanette, and uh, <coughs> my apologies. Uh, we had a couple of presentations, and I messed her up a little bit by having the wrong one loaded. I'd like to have. Um, Bob Tipping from the Minnesota Geological Survey come up. Bob's going to talk to us a lot more in depth about the metro bedrock aquifers and the work that he's been doing at the GS to better understand those aquifers. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Bob Tipping. I'm with Minnesota Geological Survey, University of Minnesota. Today I'd like to talk to you about groundwater flow in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. Over the past few years, I've been compiling historic water chemistry data with the goal of trying to see what that distribution of chemical types says about the groundwater flow paths and residence times in the metropolitan area. 
Support for this project came through the Clean Water and Land Legacy Amendment through water resource planning projects by the Metropolitan Council and by general funds to the Minnesota Geological Survey from the state legislature through the University of Minnesota. Um, before we get started, some definitions. Flow path, which I mentioned in the title, <clears throat> is the path that water takes from where it enters the ground to where it leaves the ground water, either through a well or discharge into a stream or a river. Residence time is how long the water takes to move along that path, or another way to think of it, how long it's been underground. And chemical types, as water moves through the subsurface, it interacts, it precipitates minerals, it dissolves minerals, it picks up other pieces, and together those form a chemical fingerprint that sticks with the water as it moves through. In this talk, I'm going to focus on that chemical fingerprint that identifies waters as what we'll call recent waters, the waters that have been in the ground for less than 50 years. I'm going to be changing scales uh, a little bit during this talk, and this slide is used to illustrate an important point. The top of the full shade tower, if you can see that red line, is the depth essentially to the bottom of the Jordan Aquifer, which Dr. Lee had mentioned as being one of the major or the major workhorse aquifer in the metropolitan area, along with the Prairie du Chien group up above it. Top of the IDS center is about 800 feet tall, and that's the depth of the top of the Mount Simon uh, within the metropolitan area. Okay. So if we look at these in cross section across the metropolitan area, we can kind of see where these layers are. Um, Just before you uh, go on, yes. we are getting a little feedback here. And I'm hearing folks, that too. If folks have cell phones on, would you uh, choose to turn them off? Thank you. Okay, so this map is, this uh, slide is to show two things. First is the distribution of these major aquifers in the metropolitan area, and then I've included a cross section at the bottom to show what they look like underground. And if you can see that red line I just clicked on, that would be the uh, essentially the top of the Fauchet building or the bottom of the Jordan Aquifer. And the second line, top of the IDS or the top of the uh, depth to the top of the Mount Simon Aquifer in the central metropolitan area. These rock layers sit in what's referred to as the Twin Cities Artesian Basin. Artesian is a groundwater term that you're familiar with. It means where water can freely flow out of a well uh, due to higher pressures in the aquifers below it. Uh, before development in the metro area and growth in the metropolitan area, essentially any well drilled into the Artesian Basin would be our Artesian well uh, with water flowing out the top of it. Uh, those strategic conditions still exist, especially along the major rivers. Uh, the Science Museum in Minnesota has a display well in, that is a Jordan well that is artesian, mildly artesian, although those conditions diminish in the summertime and sometimes disappear due to summer pumping. Um, the last thing you should notice on this slide is that these aquifers are of limited extent. These bedrock aquifers, if you go out to the northwest up into Sherburne County and the city of Becker, these aquifers are no longer available as a water source. So the city of Becker uh, has a 50-foot well uh, that's finished in sand and gravel, and uh, that's where they get their water from. Uh, the scale on this, from the city of Becker to downtown St. Paul, is about 50 miles. So the cross-section below, you can see the horizontal and the vertical scales are not the same, and that actually these bedrock aquifers in a regional sense are really quite close to the land surface. In order to understand groundwater flow, you should understand something about the container. In the Twin Cities metropolitan area, uh, geologic maps from the Geologic County Atlases have produced detailed descriptions and maps of the bedrock units on the lower left and the glacier units on the upper right. The colors represent bedrock types uh, uh, in the, for the bedrock map of sandstone, shales, or carbonates that have different water bearing characteristics. And the glacial materials up on the upper uh, right, the greens show clay materials that don't really let water move through them very easily, and sandier materials at the surface that can let water move more freely into the subsurface. Groundwater, as Dr. Lee and, 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 and Jim Stark have been explaining, basically is moving uh, through the landscape towards topographic lows on the land surface. So for both bedrock systems and for glacial systems, water moves towards the major discharge uh, areas in the Twin Cities, which are major rivers, the Minnesota River, the St. Croix, and the Mississippi. 
So if you measured water levels in those wells, in the upper right, for example, in the bedrock wells, you'd see a pattern of water moving towards those major rivers. In the lower left, in the glacial aquifers, it's the same basic pattern, although a little bit more detailed. It's the same pattern of groundwater moving towards discharging towards these topographic lows, the major rivers within the Twin Cities metropolitan area. And the elevation of those rivers in downtown St. Paul is about 700 feet above sea level, and we'll come back to that number as we move on to this talk. Dr. Lee showed you an example from the Mount Simon Aquifer for synoptic water level measurements. These are the same synoptic water level measurements for the Pergachain Jordan Aquifer in the Twin Cities area. So the hotter colors are showing drawdown, seasonal drawdown between March and August. Uh, the effect of high capacity pumping these wells and the hot colors that you're looking at uh, south, uh, southeastern Hennepin County, uh, northern uh, Dakota County, and northwestern Dakota County, those drawdowns are on the order of about 25 feet or more over seasonal, uh, seasonal change. This map is to show distribution of water chemistry and this is as far as we're going to go in terms of data uh, uh, data types. On the right hand side, the hot colors, the red colors are showing, uh, excuse me, all the dots on the right hand side are showing tritium concentrations in groundwater. Tritium is an uh, isotope of hydrogen, <clears throat> is, so it becomes naturally part of the water molecule. Uh, it increased in concentration of the atmosphere pretty dramatically in the 1950s, late 1950s, early 1960s due to atmospheric testing nuclear weapons. So as such, it becomes part of precipitation in the form of rain and snow. So the red dots on the right-hand side are wells that have more tritium, higher concentrations of tritium in them. And we interpret that to be the water that has entered the ground pretty much in the last 50 years. So this is the advent of the atmospheric testing of these nuclear weapons. The blue colors are wells that don't have any tritium in them at all. And the greens are the values that we look at to be in between as a mixture of both recent waters and older waters. On the left-hand side, you're looking at chloride measurements. These chlorides in groundwaters are coming from things like road salt or septic tanks. Um, these chlorides have a similar pattern to tritium in that the hotter colors are in the central metropolitan area and the cooler colors, the blues, are up to the west and the north. Point being here that these chlorides are from land surface activities and give us an indication in terms of the water chemistry of waters that have been in the ground uh, for less than 50 years. If we take all those tritium wells and we look at the elevations of the water intake portion of those wells, where the water is actually entering the well and contour, then we come up with these contours that you see on the left. Those contours in turn can be converted into a surface that you're looking at on the right. And the higher chlorides, uh, things related to human activities at the land surface, including groundwater contaminants, typically occur in groundwater above that surface. So how does this depth of recent water compare to the elevation of these major discharge areas that we've been talking about, these topographic lows of the major rivers in the metropolitan area? If we take those contours and tip them back, if you can see that, there's a blue line I just added to the screen, it's the elevation of those major rivers, that 700, 700 foot elevation above sea level that we talked about before. The red contours are below that discharge elevation. So if we add in some dots, in this case these spheres represent the depth of the water intake portions of high capacity wells or pumping wells in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. The size of the spheres are relative to their proportional to the size of the amount that they pump and what they report to the Department of Natural Resources. And now if we tip that slide back up, we see the similar patterns of the locations of where these pumping wells are are and the depth and the distribution of recent waters in, uh, in the Twin Cities aquifers. What I want to do, if you can see these, is to step through a few cross sections to see how these, uh, the distribution of these waters is related not only to pumping but also to the distribution of the materials that are on top of bedrock. And the first one we're going to look at is from uh, Wright County uh, down to the Mississippi River. And in this cross-section, and I'm sorry, I apologize, it's difficult to see, but 
what you're what I've done is I've drawn in a red line of where that recent water is at depth, and you'll see it over to the right. And then I've also added those red lines up on top so you can see what this distribution pattern of, of recent water is being at deeper at greater depths in the central metropolitan area. The other thing you should notice on this slide is the stuff that's on top of the gray bedrock. It's uh, glacial mapping in detail of what the material is on top of the bedrock units. And the darker colors, if you can, again, if you can see them, I'm sorry this isn't larger, but if you can see them, the darker colors represent clay materials and the lighter sandy uh, materials are, are displayed in, in, uh, in yellow. <coughs> And besides the recent waters that are that you see in the central part of the metropolitan area, metropolitan area there is also some numbers down the lower hand left, uh, excuse me, lower hand right, that show age of groundwater in the Mount Simon Aquifer um, for the cities of uh, Maple Grove, and I can't even read it, St. Louis Park. In years, those are on the orders of thousands of years. That's how long this water has been in the ground. So again, the over short distances in terms of, of depth between the Prairie du Chien and Jordan Aquifer and the Mount Simon, you have a huge range in what we call groundwater residence times or the age that water has been in the ground. And in the Mount Simon, the ages of these waters are not on the order of manageable time scales. The second cross section I'd like to look at goes from Anoka County down to the central metropolitan area. Similar pattern, you'll see recent waters in the central part of the metro area where we have greater drawdown due to high capacity pumping. And then off to the left, you'll see that the sand plain uh, has this yellow uh, sand up the surface, which we associate with the Anoka sand plain, but that, that sand isn't continuous all the way down to bedrock. In places, that sand is, 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 uh, is continuous, and there's a, a section right in here where you can see where there's more sand coming into it. Um, physical container doesn't really change. The physical setting of these of these of our, our of our groundwater systems doesn't change, but the hydraulics can. So if you change pumping levels, as we've seen examples of it, uh, in previous talks, in this one, you can change the direction, the pattern of groundwater flow. The last cross section I want to show you is in southeastern Hennepin County. This one is a little bit easier to see. Uh, Edina well number nine has been dated. It is the Mount Simon well. It's been dated at 23,000 years. Uh, another well higher up above that in the Prairie du Chien and Jordan Aquifers has more recent water. And off to the left, there is an arrow uh, showing a well that we have measured downward flow in that well. And normally when we do full measurements in a well, we don't have video to go with it. In this case, we do, and I'd like to show you what that looks like. Oh, and one more thing. This, this, uh, in these thought slides we're going to see, or in the video, we'll see depth, uh, um, and sometimes depth and elevation can get a little bit confusing. We're going to start off with a depth in this video of about 426 feet down below the land surface. On this cross section, that translates into an elevation of about 475 feet, roughly where the black arrow is. But again, we are down uh, well below that 700 foot elevation of, of regional discharge under natural groundwater flow. Oops. Excuse me. Back up. This Okay, so the video begins uh, 475 feet below the land surface, or 425, about 350 feet below the water level in this well. So we're actually in groundwater here, uh, actually within the Jordan Aquifer. Jordan Aquifer is named for the Jordan Sandstone, which we're looking at in side view here. It's composed mostly of well-rounded quartz sand grains, which when tied together leave spaces between the grains where the water can be stored and moved. Think of marbles in a jar. If that space is well connected, that's, uh, then water can move and store uh, quite a bit of water to the Jordan Aquifer. This type of space is often referred to as intergranular primary matrix permeability. But the Jordan also has fractures in it, which we call secondary permeability. And what I want you to see on this fracture is, well, see what you see. that's visible off from where you are, you're seeing little sand grains shooting into this fracture. And so we're at a depth of about 430 feet. 
well below that 700 foot elevation. In this case, groundwater is moving rapidly through this fracture towards a well, that, the nearby pumping well that's causing lower pressure as opposed to lower pressure of a topographic low at the land surface. So to summarize, bedrock aquifers in the Twin Cities metropolitan area are of limited extent and have a great range in groundwater age or residence time. The star here shows the location of the uh, Jordan Aquifer in the well that we just looked at on video. And this blue line represents that 700 foot elevation of natural groundwater discharge. High capacity pumping has changed groundwater flow patterns and residence times at regional scales and more water moves to greater depths in a shorter time span than before pumping began. And finally, understanding these patterns is required for managing groundwater <coughs> resources, both for determining the available recharge and for predicting the impact of land use decisions <laughs> on groundwater quality. And with that, I thank you. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, <coughs> Ali Mel El Hassan from Met Council is going to come up, and he's going to talk about some work the Met Council has been doing. Uh, using some of this information to develop some more current models. This will be our last presentation that's going to focus on the metropolitan area. And then Jim Seal is going to come up and he's going to talk about um, what we're experiencing in some of the communities around rural Minnesota. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Ali El Hassan. I'm the manager of water supply planning in the Metropolitan Council. Uh, in 2005, uh, the legislators directed the Metro Council uh, to carry out planning activities for water supply issues in the metro area. Since that time, we have been working to identify issues and come up with uh, tools to understand those issues and uh, try to help in uh, finding solutions for the communities that's going to face these issues within the metropolitan area. Uh, it's important to note that half of the Minnesota uh, state population lives in the metro area. 70% of uh, the population who live here in the metro area are pumping groundwater through municipal wells. Uh, over the years, we observed increased reliance on groundwater supplies to meet water demand in the metro area. Uh, until the end of the 70s, uh, as you can see from this graph, uh, the metro area most of the water supply is coming from surface water, and this is mainly because the development was happening in the two main core cities, St. Paul and Minneapolis, and they are, they are using surface water for their water supply. Since the 80s, and as the development started to go out in the suburbs, uh, we started seeing more reliance on groundwater. As of now, as I mentioned, 70% of the population in the metro area use groundwater as a water supply, 30% use surface water. This continued reliance on groundwater has an unfavorable impact on both the aquifer and the surface water features like lakes and streams. As you have heard from the previous presentations, um, one way to look at the uh, impact on the aquifer is by reviewing groundwater levels from monitoring wells or observation wells. In the metro area, Department of Natural Resources keep uh, records of uh, several uh, observation wells around the area. This slide here is showing three of those uh, observation wells, and I think Dr. Lee showed you one of them. It's a little bit in, in a bigger a projection than these ones. But one of the things that you can observe in all of those three, there is a trend uh, of declining water levels over the long period of the record of those wells. Um, one, some of those observation wells showed one foot per year for the record of that well. If you are losing one foot per year, that's not recovered uh, in that well. As I mentioned, uh, continued reliance on groundwater also have adverse impacts on surface water. 
bodies such as lakes and streams in the area. A good example of that is what's happening in White Bear Lake, the lake level declines in White Bear Lake. Uh, as uh, Jim Stark from USGS mentioned about that in, in the first presentation, that the studies that uh, conducted by USGS concluded that there is a correlation between the increased groundwater pumping in the area and the decline in the lake levels in White Bear Lake. These impacts on aquifers as well as surface water features indicates that greater reliance on groundwater resources is not sustainable. And this, these impacts are inconsistent with the goal of the Master Water Supply Plan that we developed and approved in 2010 for the metro area, as well as it disagrees with the definition, the legislative definition for the sustainability, which I think also uh, Jim Stark talked about that. So for uh, us in, in, in coming up with tools that will help us in understand these issues and understand the cumulative impacts of different uh, communities' water supply decisions, uh, we needed a tool, a management tool that will help us. Uh, and that was developing a groundwater flow model. We call it Metro Model 2. Uh, the model help us to understand the uh, different management scenarios that we can see in the metro area as a result of different uh, decisions from different uh, communities with regard to their water supplies. The regional model uh, considers long-term average flow among the region's nine principal bedrock layers that Dr. Tipping was talking about in the previous presentation. The model currently covers an area of approximately 5,000 square feet. Uh, this model incorporated a lot of good information that's available at the time when we developed the model, uh, such as the uh, pumping records that the Department of Natural Resources is uh, having, as well as observation well data, uh, as other geologic information. We incorporated all of that uh, in developing this model. As I mentioned, we have been using this model for different management scenarios. And one of the uh, scenarios that we tested uh, is the uh, different pumping scenarios in the future. And uh, for these scenarios, we use the projected population for 2030, uh, assuming and, and understanding that the, the, the metro area is going to add about half a million people by 2030. And we translated that into what would be the additional demand, and we used that to create four scenarios. The first scenario is business as usual. In the business as usual, we uh, assume that all this new population is going to pump groundwater as their main source of, of, of water supply. Uh, and we used other three different scenarios, uh, mainly to reduce that amount of pumping by 30%, 50%, and 80%. In the next following slides, I'm going to show the results of uh, only three of those scenarios. This is the business as usual scenario. And uh, one thing to mention about all of those three graphs that I'm going to show is blue color indicates decline, the additional decline in the water levels in the aquifer. And this is mainly the Prairie du Chien aquifer, which is the main water supply aquifer in the metro area. So the darker the blue, it's the uh, greater the decline in the aquifer. The red indicates that 50% of the water column is uh, depleted, and this is by the standards of the Department of Natural Resources. So looking at this, we see that we have a lot of dark blue and uh, some red in around uh, many of the places in the metro area. This is a different, this is the other scenario by reducing the additional pumping by 30%. And we can see that we still have blue, we still have fewer darker blue, and some red locations, which indicates still we have decline. And, uh, but comparing this to the previous one, it's uh, a better scenario that continue as usual. 
This is the 80% reduction of pumping, of additional pumping in the future. And this indicates that this is a, bit, a much better picture for the metro area uh, uh, with regard to the aquifer declines. We can see that there is very few dark blue uh, spots in the area and very, very few red areas. Um, this is the end of my presentation. I had seven minutes only. And uh, um, as we continue working, we are, uh, we are still improving our modeling capabilities. Uh, we're still working with uh, improving and incorporating more of the information that Dr. Tipping is finishing. And we are incorporating also, uh, we're improving the model so that it can account for seasonal change in the aquifers uh, in the future. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sure there are going to be questions. Thanks, Alvi. Uh, now I'd like to have uh, Jim Seal come up, and he's going to talk about uh, rural Minnesota. Uh, good morning, Chair, members. Thank you for inviting me to testify this morning. My name is Jim Seal, hydrologist with the Department of Natural Resources, Division of Ecological and Water Resources. I'm housed out of our Marshall office out in southwest Minnesota. This morning I'm here to testify about groundwater challenges in rural Minnesota, specifically more into the southwest corner of the state. I want to focus on three things today. Agricultural irrigation, wet industry such as ethanol, and domestic and municipal supply. Ag irrigation, it's an expanding thing in Minnesota. Land values are going up, crop values are going up, and it's a real incentive for landowners to uh, install an irrigation well and <coughs> apply water at critical times of uh, plant growth, specifically or mostly focused on uh, corn and soybeans. Minnesota, we have about 7,000 irrigation wells. <coughs> This photo depicts where they're located. You can see they're mostly located in the central part of the state, although we do have a number of them in the southwest and in the metro area. This slide depicts the number of irrigation permits that the Department of Natural Resources has issued over the last uh, 20 years. You can see approximately 20 years ago we were issuing around 50 permits each year. In the last 10 years, that's gone up somewhere close to 200 permits at times. The blue lines indicate permits that have been issued in those individual fiscal years. Uh, fiscal year 2013, shown on the far end of the uh, graph, we've issued approximately 93, 94 permits, and we anticipate approximately an additional 90-some uh, permits by the end of uh, June of this year. So we can see a large increase and that's reflected because of uh, climate change and high land values out there in rural Minnesota. This is the water use. Uh, Dr. Lee showed you this was part of the overall water use, but this specifically deals with agricultural irrigation. So you can see on the uh, Far left-hand side is the 88 drought. You get into the early 90s, there wasn't much water used in 93 because it was a really wet year out there. We've seen a steady increase in water use throughout Minnesota for ag irrigation. We average about 68 billion gallons of water each year for irrigation. Um, you, if you look at 2010, which was a fairly dry year, or excuse me, a fairly wet year, uh, we're still using a lot more or almost as much as we did in the 88 drought. And it just reflects the larger number of uh, irrigation wells that we've added in the last 20 years. I'm going to move on to another community out in the southwest part of the state. Granite Falls Energy is an ethanol plant produces about 70 million gallons of ethanol each year. They use about 110 million gallons of water each year to produce that product. It's located in the south, well, the southern end of uh, Chippewa County, just outside the community of Granite Falls. About uh, 2004, the plant 
was exploring for water out there. We told them it was a really uh, uh, poor area of uh, water availability. They moved forward with, uh, on there, there's a couple red dots. That's to the east of the orange dot, which is the uh, plant facility. That's where their groundwater wells are. We did some testing with the, the facility and we had real reservations about the amount of water and the sustainability of that groundwater source. Plant moved forward with uh, production knowing that they would have limited groundwater availability there and they transitioned over to use of surface water from the Minnesota River about a year and a half after they started production at the facility. This slide here is a cross section of the earth. On the left hand side is the well that they use for groundwater production. Over on the right hand side is a well that depicts a shallower aquifer that is connected to the deeper formation from which the ethanol plant pumps water. The red line that takes the steep dip in the middle about 2004 to 2005 are the water levels in that aquifer that the ethanol plant is pumping from. Steep decline to the point where we were working with them to get them switched over to the surface water source as soon as possible. So in approximately February of 2007, uh, 2006, they stopped using groundwater and went to the river. You can see how the water level rebounded in that deeper aquifer. It took four and a half years for water levels to recover back to what they were before the plants started pumping. You also notice in that top line there, there's a baby blue line. That depicts the water level in the shallower formation. That's where we were seeing impacts because of the connection <coughs> between the aquifers. We were seeing water level declines in that upper formation resulting in uh, well interferences with domestic wells some of them up to six miles away from the production wells. So what we're seeing on the far end of that red graph is this past summer, 2012, we get into drought conditions, water levels in the river declined to the point where the uh, well had to, uh, they had to go back on the well and we're seeing declines. And just to fix it, this is a, not a real sustainable sort system and we're talking jobs out there. We're going to move on to rural water systems in Minnesota. There's six of them in Minnesota. They're all west, all on the west end of the state. There's three in the northwest, three in the southwest. I'm going to focus on one of them in the southwest, which is Lincoln Pipestone Rural Water. This is the map of uh, Lincoln Pipestone Rural Water. It covers parts of 11 counties out there. Um, there's surface water features. This been a, uh, Dr. Leet mentioned earlier, calcareous fens. Uh, there are some trout streams out there, and there's also a federally endangered fish species, the uh, Topeka Shiner, that they're involved with. And all of these surface water features seem to be located near the production wells for Lincoln Pipestone Rural Water. Also on this map, there's some dots down below there. Uh, Lincoln Pipestone, because of the limited availability of water, buying water from a rural water system in Iowa to provide water to some of their customers as well as the city of Worthington, which we'll talk about later. They're also looking at buying water from the city of Madison that's outside their uh, uh, boundaries. And they're looking to South Dakota to buy water from a rural water system out there as well as the Lewis and Clark rural water system which is projected to provide water up to a million gallons a day to Lincoln Pipestone in 2017. Surface water features out there that they're impacting. This is a hydrograph showing water levels in a calcareous fen located near one of their uh, Lincoln Pipestone uh, well fields. And it took a lot of time and a lot of money on the part of the uh, Lincoln Pipestone folks and DNR staff to develop a working model and relationship of water levels to ensure the viability of this calcareous fan. They have two thresholds, one in the summer, one in the winter, that they have to uh, keep water levels above to protect that fan from uh, uh, going dry. This is a depiction of that and what it is, it's providing enough push of that uh, water 
to sustain the dome on that calcareous back. Other issues that they've run into, Topeka shiners, as I mentioned earlier, uh, irrigation moving in close to their well fields. That's a concern on the part of the rural water systems and also ag drainage up there above their uh, recharge zones. Moving on to the next community, City of Marshall, located in Lyon County, about 14,000 people. They use about a billion gallons of water a year. This is what uh, is reflected in one of their aquifers. They've lost 50 feet of uh, head on that aquifer since 1990. It's not sustainable, and we've been working with them to find a new source. They moved out about 13 miles north of the city of Marshall. They drilled a bunch of wells out there in conjunction with Lincoln Pipestone Rural Water. We did a, quite a bit of testing. There's calcareous vents to the east of this. During that testing, we saw potential impacts at the calcareous vents as well as some of the surface water features. Lincoln Pipestone pulled out of this area after spending a little over a million dollars and walked away with nothing on this uh, exploration. City of Marshall, we're working with them. It appears that their pumping did not cause as much impact out there. We're moving forward with the permit. They, the two of them spent combined $2.4 million on exploration. City of Marshall anticipates it's going to cost them $10 million to put the pipeline in and get the water down to their residents. Worthington, located down in Nobles County, about the same size as Marshall, use about a billion gallons of water a year. This is a, depicts their uh, well field. The red dots are their wells. Specifically, want to deal with the uh, wells way at the south end. They actually created a reservoir to recharge their well system for the community. They pumped that water all the way up to the city there. 2012. We saw water levels starting to decline in their water uh, in their wells, which is showing over on the right hand side. Not as bad as it was in 2000, um, around 2000, when they had some real dry conditions down there. Not as bad as 2000 or 1988, but we're heading in a downward trend down there. And the next pictures will show that uh, that's what their lake looks like next to their well field. If you look on the uh, right hand side, you can see two of their wells that are finished down into the lower formation, but the recharge comes from that dark area out there in the middle. It's a large man-made reservoir. They ran out of water this year, and they're actually working with the department to uh, transition water uh, from one of the lakes between the city and this well field to augment water levels in that aquifer. It got so bad this year they did an emergency interconnect with Osceola Rural Water in Iowa and they're currently getting 350 gallons per minute from Iowa to sustain uh, uh, production in the community. So I want to wrap up with some of the, uh, the drivers out there in our part of the state. You know, we desire many things out there. We want industrial growth. We want municipal and domestic supply to uh, grow our communities out there. And we also want to have agricultural growth. But the reality is there are a lot of limitations, especially out there in the uh, western part of the state where climate change is causing uh, conflicts with water availability. And so in conjunction with that, we're also seeing impacts on our natural features out there. So those are the things that we need to take into account when we are uh, reviewing permits for communities and new industry out there. Thank you. Well, members, we are ready for uh, questions. We had some, certainly toward the end, some pretty sobering things to think about. Uh, Representative Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I get my first question is for Mr. Stark. And yes, if folks could just bring up chairs so as questions, uh, maybe if the pages could help and put some chairs up there so everybody can be right at the microphone. We don't have a lot of time for questions, but I, I would like people to be available. <clears throat> Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Stark, uh, we've heard quite a bit of talk today about White Bear Lake. It's, uh, I'm over here, sorry. Uh, Representative Paul Torkelson. Uh, we've heard quite a bit of talk about White Bear Lake. It's my understanding that at one time groundwater was pumped into White Bear Lake. Do we have records as to when and how much water was pumped in? Hmm. Representative Aguinius, uh, Representative Torkelson. Uh, your question about White Bear Lake is an interesting one. Yes, there, um, there was a time, a lengthy period of time, from about the, um, the 30s until I believe into the 70s where uh, lakes, White Bear Lake and other lakes in Ramsey County were supplemented uh, by wells which pumped from um, the deeper aquifers. And I, I think we have... Uh, we have good records on, on that pumping uh, that from Natural Resources has also done in the past a study on the effectiveness of, of uh, pumping groundwater into the lake to supplement water levels. And uh, I think the uh, synopsis of that was that that was not very effective and uh, um, the efficiency of that system was very quite poor. So by uh, statute, I think that uh, ended in the 70s and has not continued uh, from that time. Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I'm in no way uh, suggesting that we restart that program, but what I would like to point out is that uh, the problems in White Bear Lake are not necessarily brand new, that uh, there's been an issue with lake levels there for quite some time. Uh, Representative Torkelson, that's correct. However, I think the, um, the recent work that's been done has suggested that there's um, a new issue there. And certainly um, the low precipitation, low rainfall snowfall has had an effect and has been a part of the story on the water level decline in White Bear Lake and other lakes in Ramsey County. Uh, but the data that uh, we have looked at, the chemical data, the water use data, uh, and the direction of flow information around the lake suggests that there's something else going on there now. So in addition to precipitation, um, there are several lines of evidence that suggest that municipal pumping, which is the prim primary uh, groundwater pumping around the lake, is also uh, adding to that problem and, and affecting lake levels. Thank you. I will uh, save my other questions for a later date. Uh, Representative Fisher? Oh, they have a question. You have a question? Oh, no. Oh, Representative Fabian, I'm sorry. Madam yeah, Chair, sure. I, I, I did not have a question. Thank you. Well, we are missing up here a little bit. How about other questions from members? I'll try one more time, Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. Sure. Again, my question also directed to Mr. Stark. Uh, the map you have on the estimates of recharge, uh, I would assume that recharge is almost entirely dependent on, on precipitation totals. So my question is, why is the recharge level so low across the entire western part of the state? Uh, it's a little bit of a complex question, but the simplified answer to that is um, there's a big gradient in precipitation across the state. Um, the western part of the state gets much less precipitation. That's one of the factors. The other one uh, are the character of the soils. So the soils are much tighter. They uh, don't allow percolation of precipitation into the groundwater system as well as they do in some other parts of the state. So those two things uh, in combination, in addition, the evaporation in the west is significantly greater. Uh, than in the eastern part, and particularly in the northeastern part of the state. So several things work in concert to, to make that big gradient across the state of Minnesota. Well, let me ask a, a similar question in a different way. Where do we know in this state, uh, or where are we confident that we understand the recharge of the groundwater? What areas of the state or or municipalities, where are we confident that we know uh, what the recharge is? Well, we have a, a general picture across the state, and, and we're in the process now uh, in collaboration with the Pollution Control Agency to refine that 
uh, and to quantify that in more detail across the state. Where we know, where we have the most precise information now are really uh, in areas where the surficial, the surface aquifers have been studied in great, greatest detail, uh, where we have stream flow information that uh, is long-term <coughs> critic for certain parts of the state, uh, and where there have been groundwater models that have been done of groundwater surface water systems. Those are generally uh, in the sand plain areas of Minnesota where irrigation pressure has been greatest. That's where they've been studied in the most detail. So, so we know them. Um, we're, we're working on that. Um, the best data are in those areas where the greatest detail has been studied. Okay, so how much of a portion of the state, maybe I'll put it a different way, how much of a portion of the state uh, do we understand what the recharge is? Is well, it 10 percent, 50 percent? We know it in general across the whole state, and we're working on refining that. Um, specifically, the greatest detail probably is a, about a quarter of the state. Okay. And of that quarter of the state, are we confident uh, in that recharge? In other words, I know that models have been done, uh, but do we have the wells to test those models? I think in those areas we do. That being said, though, uh, those recharge rates are changing. And um, what has happened in the past with respect to processes that recharge our aquifers, those, those are changing because of global change and things that are happening around us. Are, uh, for that, I hear weather patterns there. Are those recharge rates changing because of our well system too? I mean, changing flow patterns, is that? I mean, both pumping and, uh, and precipitation events and change in both of those are affecting the amount of water that we charge. Are there any other factors besides those two? Uh, one of them might be uh, um, agricultural drainage, which certainly affects the amount of water that can filter. Wouldn't that be similar then in the metro area where we have all the storm sewer systems? To uh, the, the processes are similar, right? The uh, stormwater management that we do to retain stormwater uh, ultimately affects the amount of water that recharges uh, our groundwater system. So I take from that the historical, we are no longer in the historical patterns of recharge because we have these additional factors that are affecting our recharge? Yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, there have been several papers published throughout the country that suggest that stationarity or the stationarity or the way that things have been in the past uh, are no longer the best guide in trying to understand what may happen in the future. Representative McNamara, did you have a question? Madam Chair, in the interest of time, um, Representative. Oh, <coughs> board. Madam Chair, uh, thank you for taking questions. I, in the interest of time, I have a lot of questions. I think other people do too. Will there be an opportunity for some of these people to come back? Well, here's here's the 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 plan, and I uh, I have one more question. But here's here is the plan. We are going to have uh, one more hearing. Uh, general information like this uh, with uh, folks from the agencies. Toward the end of February, we will have, so people have a digest this, can go back home and think about it. We will have another hearing where we invite other people in to talk with us. Uh, we'll certainly ask the agency folks back. Uh, I particularly did not ask folks to put uh, suggestions uh, for how we might improve our system. Uh, we need to understand what's going on first, uh, but then we'll have that opportunity in late February. Haven't set the date yet, but I would say uh, it will be before we get the February forecast. Does that work? Members, is that a satisfactory plan? Uh, Representative Clark has the last question. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, I was thinking we had about 10, but I guess we're out of time now. I, I, so I just want to put a question out there that could maybe be discussed later, and that is, 
the numbers on the gallons per usage by households, I just would be interested in the trends on that. And pumping was something that was talked about. I, when you were talking about the people in Worthington, I, I know the folks down there and some of the hardships that probably caused them about not being able to have water in their homes. I'm, enough water. I'm, but I'm just interested. I, I saw the number of 400 gallons per day in an average household. I grew up carrying water. We didn't have running water until I was 11. And I figured that would be 80 trips a day to the pump that I would have had to make. <laughs> I'm just wondering about the trends and what you can tell us about that at another time, I guess. Yeah, we, we will have additional opportunities because there, there are so many questions out there. Thanks to folks who came and testified. Thanks to members. And I see no other questions. And with that, we'll adjourn. <laughs>